In this WrestleTalk news, WWE is scared of Finn Balor going to AEW, Raquel Gonzalez is on her way out of NXT, Ollie's review of last night's AEW Dynamites featuring the return of Jon Moxley, and more. I'm going to be challenging for the Jam That Championship next week at the Royal Rumble, so I need you to help me win it back. Just kidding, I can do it myself. But subscribing is the only way to help me win back. Don't ask me how I don't make the rules. Just subscribe and enable notifications to always on for daily wrestling news videos. Support Wrestle Talk! Over the many decades that Vince McMahon has been in charge of WWF and then WWE, there's been countless stories of weird Vince quirks, whether it be his dislike of people sneezing, making sure he was clean shaven so that the beard can't win, not knowing what a burrito is, or his favourite thing in the whole world being the look on someone's face when he pushes them in a pool. Vince McMahon's a very normal person. There's a new one to add to the list of Vince McMahon-isms, courtesy of former NXT coach Scotty Too Hotty, who appeared on Talk Is Jericho to talk about the changes taking place in NXT and why he left the company. Vince wants the coaches looking younger, so we need you guys to start dyeing your beards and cutting your hair. The, the coaches, the NXT coaches, those people who aren't on camera ever, those guys, he needed them to look younger. And yet Vince himself is on Raw every week, mumbling through promos with Austin Theory, looking like the reanimated husk of someone that's been dead for 20 years. Sounds about right. He's a weird dude, isn't he? But getting into actual wrestling news, Finn Balor hasn't been up to much lately, losing clean to Austin Theory on this week's Raw, and not really doing anything of substance since he lost to Roman Reigns at Extreme Rules last September. Wait, no, sorry, checks notes, he lost to the top rope. Unsurprisingly, there's been a report from Ringside News saying that Creative has no plans for Balor, and moreover, Vince never had faith in Balor at all, calling him filler on the roster. But with all these budget cuts and slimming down of the company and so, 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 so many releases, will we see Balor on the chopping block next? Well, no. Because according to this report, WWE don't want him going to AEW. The report notes that WWE are aware that AEW would bend over backward for Balor, and even if Balor's contract was around a million dollars a year, that's pocket change for them. To me, this makes absolutely no sense. If WWE are aware that Balor would be an asset to another company, then surely they've got to realise that he could be an asset to their own company. Or if they truly think he's just a filler guy on the roster, then in their minds, it doesn't matter if he goes to AEW because he's just a filler guy. But this is Vince, NXT coaches have to dye their beards to make them look younger, McMahon we're talking about, so who knows. But someone who doesn't have to dye their beard yet is Raquel Gonzalez, who after failing to regain the NXT Women's Championship is currently being positioned to be Cora Jade's odd couple tag partner for the Women's Dusty Classic. Well, according to Brian Alvarez on Wrestling Observer Live, this might be the last thing Gonzalez does in NXT as she is on her way out of the brand. But despite being ready to move to presumably the main roster, she's being kept around in NXT for now as they need people to fill out spots in the aforementioned Dusty Classic. Gonzalez could be a force to be reckoned with on the main roster. She is very tall after all, so expect her to be somebody's ineffectual muscle that is the cause for many, 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 many DQ and distraction finishes. Now before we get into Ollie's review of AEW Dynamite, here's a quick word from today's sponsor. Before we get on with the rest of the video, I'd just like to say a big thank you to this episode's sponsor, Surfshark VPN, which you can get 83% off and three months free if you go to surfshark.deals forward slash WrestleTalk and use the code WrestleTalk. Surfshark VPN lets you trick your device into thinking it's in another country, which opens up a whole new world of content libraries. If you're in the UK, you can watch US Netflix, which has a far bigger selection of movies. This. If you're outside the UK, you can watch the BBC iPlayer. And if you're in the US, you can finally get access back to the old WWE Network with its far superior functionality. I hate change. We've all been using Surfshark here at WrestleTalk for years now. It's our official VPN. And it doesn't just let us gain access to all the wrestling. It also secures our networks by encrypting internet traffic, keeping our location and download history private. My collection of ultra swole Pokemon must be protected at all costs. And my favorite feature for this is that Surfshark knows when my phone leaves a trusted connection like my home or work internet, and it immediately turns on to prevent interference. It's 
like having a babyface wrestling faction for your phone. So sign up to Surfshark today by clicking our link in the video description below, surfshark.deals forward slash wrestle talk, where you'll get 83% off and three months free if you use the code wrestle talk. We'd really appreciate if you at least check them out as they're a great company and we love working with them. Support wrestle talk and support your internet privacy with Surfshark. Now it's time for my review of AEW Dynamite in about five minutes. The show opened on the triumphant return of John Moxley just three months after he bravely entered rehab for alcohol addiction and looking about 10 years younger. And in true John Moxley style, he immediately said the F word uncensored on live TV. Unfortunately, it wasn't a cathartic F yeah, but a disappointed go F yourself. Hey, that's Jericho's gimmick whether it gets over or not. Moxley entered the ring after an even more spine-tingling entrance through the crowd than usual, and just before he was about to start his welcome back promo, someone in the audience yelled, get this trash out the ring. To which Moxley replied, GFY, I got you Jericho, and get this piece of S out of here. The crowd then almost overcorrected for that one idiot, being respectfully silent for the remainder of the promo which took a bit of the atmosphere out. But he still spoke brilliantly about the scars inside and the demons on your back making you who you are. But he doesn't run from demons, he beats the S out of them. He's more dangerous than ever because all he drinks now is blood. It was great to see him back and the promo delivery and content were awesome. Unfortunately, one douchebag stopped it being perfection. The following intergender match of Adam Cole and Britt Baker versus Orange Cassidy and Chris Statlander, however, was everything I wanted it to be and more. The rules, like WWE, were men on men and women on women. But tell that to the gender barrier breaker Cassidy, who unleashed a series of devastating kicks to Baker early on. Cole and Cassidy, and Chris and Britt by extension, have this opposite to tracked chemistry that works incredibly for me. They can seamlessly hop between comedy to action-packed false finishes in a way that few wrestlers can. And and by the end, this drama was totally absorbing. Especially the full 30 seconds after Cassidy kicked out the Panama Sunrise, while Cole looked at Britt going, Huh? And Britt looked back at Cole like, What? Huh? What? Huh? What? But Cassidy unleashed undisputed boyfriend Adam Cole when he knocked Baker through a table outside. So Cole punched him right in the bay bays and won. But Cole wasn't done there. He then challenged Cassidy to an anything goes, no DQ, lights out match at next week's Beach Break special. Because AEW, for some reason, are intent on keeping Beach Break as a midwinter event. Jericho is still trying to make GFY happen, so Santana and Ortiz walked out on him with the line, you feel me? Which led to Jericho's unintentionally hilarious reply, like a fish out of water teacher in a state school trying to connect with their troubled students. No, I don't feel you. After MJF apologised to Wardlow in the only way MJF knows how, by docking his pay on his birthday, CM Punk took on Sean Spears. I love Spears' character. He's like the supporting Batman villain you like more than the main villain. He doesn't get enough love. And Punk beat him in 20 seconds with a GTS and it was perfect. What an excellent instalment in the Punk-MJF feud, where Max has constantly called out Punk for not being able to put away lesser opponents in quick fashion. Punk chased off an MJF sneak attack afterwards. The Butt Boys want to shot at Jurassic Express's tag titles so they beat up Christian. And then came probably the most anticipated thing on the show. You just crossed over into the Cody. zone. Thanks for your support on Patreon. The Baker, Adam Cakebread, and Arnie K. The K stands for the coolest dude ever. You can get your own shout out by going to patreon.com forward slash wrestle talk. Cody Rhodes made his return from COVID and contract uncertainty and cut a typically excellent promo. He said everyone's cheering for Punk right now, but if you look at everything he laid out in his 2011 Pipe Bomb promo, it was Cody who executed. Cody started an alternative. Cody carried the anti-monopoly mission on his back. Cody built the forbidden door. And he joked about renaming people Gunner McGillicutty for good measure. I know, a TNA Gunner reference, weird. He said that is why he won't turn heel. But if you ask me going by this promo, he certainly ain't a face. Cody's delivery was transformed. 
This wasn't his blue-eyed, white meat style of speech, but the inflections and cadence of his comic book bad guy act we saw in Ring of Honor. Bit of stardust thrown in too. I couldn't see a way out of the cheer boo vortex he was trapped in, but I knew he could find a way. Always bet on Cody. If he carries down this path, He's a goddamn tweener. He set up a ladder match against Sammy to decide the undisputed TNT champion at next week's beach break in midwinter. Malachi Black and Brody King looked awesome in their first tag match together, where they were introduced as honoring the House of Black, not representing it. Fear got the better of Brian Pillman Jr. and King got the pin. Pack then joined the Zoom call, revealing that it was all a ruse. He's not in the House of Black. He's coming for revenge, setting up a mouth-watering Pack and Penta versus Black and King feud. Although I think Pack's swerve reveal would have been better done in person. Unfortunately, I still feel like Hangman Page isn't being presented as prominently as he needs to be, and the following segment came across as more of a mid-card feud than for your world title. Lance Archer beat Kaz in 10 minutes, which is not the way to rebuild Archer for an AEW title shot after a lengthy absence, and then he brawled with Hangman afterwards. In your women's segments for the evening, Anna Jay and Jade Cargill had a stilted backstage promo, Layla Hirsch quickly turned heel on her teammates Red Velvet and Statlander in an interview, and Serena Deeb made Sky Blue tap out in a few minutes. And now for your quick mid-card roundup. Rapongi Vice very politely challenged the Bucks for Rampage, complete with New Japan video footage. Team Taz don't like Dante Martin having practically everyone as an older brother. Ethan Page will face Moxley on Friday, and Andrade has bought a majority stake in the Hardy family office faction. Which is not the placement on the card I expected for Andrade after his Pack and Cody matches over the summer. The main event saw the acclaim taken on Darby Allen and 62 years young Sting, who is intent on reviving every single 30-year-old plus viewer's WCW watching childhood. And he's first match on TBS, Sting wrestled half a handicap match, with Darby getting taken out early, and then hit a splash off the stage on Caster through a table. It was genuinely incredible. In those few seconds of airborne Sting, I think we were all 20 years younger. Darby then got the pin off the coffin drop. Sting continued to act like a much younger man, as Darby tweeted a video of them getting caught in traffic after the show, where they saw the car in front of them had the license plate AE-Dub. Yeah. All right, we're, we're gonna surprise me and Stinger and surprise this guy. What did you think of Dynamite? Let me know in the comments. 71% of you went for It's a Flying Sting! In our poll on a poll match on the community tab. Moxley's return, the intergender tag and flying sting in the main event, Punk Spears squash, this was a typically great two hours of wrestling TV from AEW. But it does suffer from a focus problem with such a large roster and additional show to promote on Fridays, and the women are still being grossly underserved. This week's Dynamite is four out of five. Now watch Adam Blompier's 10 best one-off Royal Rumble entrance of all time. We're looking at wrestlers who've only got one Royal Rumble appearance under their belt, but use that single go around to either mark a big achievement, make an enduring memory, or simply have a laugh. And who doesn't love to laugh? I know I do. <laughs> and the like. Anyway, I'm Adam Hailing from Parts Fun Known, and here are our 10 best one-time Royal Rumble entrants. 